Hello and welcome back to the experiment. This week's essay is titled Reading Space and Place. It was written on the 24th of the 1st, 2023, at 9.29pm. Reading Space and Place was the name of a class I took last semester. I didn't really know what to expect out of it, but it turned out to be extremely up my alley. The best way to describe the class is to say that it was about 40% sociology, 40% literature, and 10% geography. The truth, however, is that it was actually 100% geography. The fact of the matter is, we generally know where everything is now, and as such, geographers had to pivot. And so, they pivoted into the role they secretly already occupied. Geography has never really been about saying where something is, it's always been about what some place means. That's what this class was about. Geography as seen throughout history and literature. We started small, examining the purpose, role, and meanings of the domestic space. Not homes, but houses. Even here is the domain of a geographer. Like countries, houses too have resource centres, population centres, highways and roads, badlands and terrain. The methods in which that the methods in which the geography of a country affects its people are the same methods in which houses affect their inhabitants. The home, as distinct from the house, is a different beast again, and it is from this distinction that we learn that a place's geography is equally defined by its physical properties and its social affordances. Relationships between people also have geographies. I really enjoyed David Seaman's five requirements for that feeling of at-homeness. First, rootedness. A place that feels like your centre from which your journeys radiate out from. Second, appropriation. A place that you have a comfortable degree of control over. Can you move furniture, put up your own art, etc. Third, regeneration. Can you physically, mentally and psychologically repair here? Fourth, at easeness. Do you feel safe? Do you feel free to be yourself and express whatever mood you are in? And fifth, warmth. An atmosphere of support, safety, and care, and somewhere that feels lived in. I greatly enjoy these measures of at-homeness. They feel accurate on a very fundamental level, and they also leave room for non-traditional homes. A Discord server can feel like a home with these measures. The assignment for this section of the course was very enjoyable. We had to produce a reflection on a domestic space we had lived in, and we had to examine how its geography affected our relationships within it, and how it affected our mental state. I've linked my essay titled A House of Chairs and Arbitrary Spaces below. The next section of the course focused on travel. This is where geography transitions from the personal to the political though of course, the two are never so easily separated. Our lessons on travel were divided into four sections. Pilgrimage, grand tours, colonial travel, and the tourist gaze. With the kind of audience I have on this channel, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that the whole institution and history of travel is deeply fraught with countless layers of conflict, oppression, manipulation, and cultural destruction. I think the biggest thing that we grappled with was the understanding that no matter what, occupying a place changes it. You cannot travel as a mere observer. You cannot, at any point, stop participating in society, wherever that might be. Travelling makes you more worldly, and it also makes the world more like you. Most of the readings for this section of the course were travel diaries and memoirs. They were frankly horrific to read a lot of the time, Isabella Bird's Unbeaten Tracks in Japan was not in fact about unbeaten tracks in Japan, but rather tracks not yet beaten by white people. She spends a lot of time on how disappointed she is. The landscape is apparently too similar to her home. Poisoned by tales of the exotic Orient, she arrived to the shock horror that in Japan, grass still grew on hills, trees still blew in the wind, and walking down a dirt trail was still laborious and exhausting. More shocking than Bird's travels in Japan was the story of Richard Burton, who disguised himself as Islamic in 1853 to take the pilgrimage to Mecca. 
There isn't that much I'm qualified to say about this, other than it was certainly not a text that held up. A bit of a yikes, as the kids might say. But see here. Look closely. I've been telling you about the dangers and problematic elements of travel. But in doing so, I have also proved its importance. Burton's actions are not only reprehensible for his disguising himself as Islam, but also for intruding on this sacred act of travel. It becomes evident how important travel is to society. The act of travel itself has, across many religions and cultures, come to be revered as an act of spiritual importance. As with most things in life, no one can give you a formula to tell you what kinds of travel are moral and what kinds are not. Sure, I can tell you that, no, you probably shouldn't go to Hawaii for a holiday. Yes, you probably can come here to Melbourne. There is so much grey area though. We can't just stop tourism to countries that are negatively affected by tourism though. We have made them dependent on tourism. They would suffer immensely if we suddenly cut them off with no additional support. They did suffer immensely when COVID destroyed tourism. These are problems that take a great deal of untangling and decolonizing. I'm going to say the word decolonizing again because it's vital to realize that really, that's the crux of this whole issue. Writing this now, I realize I'm probably going to have to travel somewhere new, somewhere I'm not comfortable, and do the filming there. The final assignment for this class was a truly bizarre one, one of the strangest assignments I've ever had. Go somewhere you have never been before, somewhere where you will be uncomfortable, go there alone, and take notes. Then we had to write a reflection on the experience, and an exegetical statement connecting our writing with the readings. The focus was on psychogeography, the ways in which our brains make sense of places, and places make sense of our brains. An acknowledgement that existing at all means you are in open dialogue with your surroundings. You and your surroundings both change each other. I decided to go to the lowest place in the city that I knew how to access. An empty car park, three levels below the supermarket, which was already one level below street level. I've linked the essay below. Being in that enormous, tessellated space, alone, under so much concrete and steel, was genuinely terrifying. I quite liked how that piece turned out, so I'd really enjoy it if you gave it a read. That's about all I have to say about that class for now. If you happen to be studying at RMIT, and you have a free elective slot, I'd highly recommend the class. It managed to teach me about writing, the world, society, politics, geography, advertising, history, religion, and most surprisingly, myself. I'm really excited to see how this class is going to continue to affect my writing, game design, and life in general going forward. Take the time to be conscious of the spaces you inhabit, physical ones and social ones. Be aware of their borders and of their geographies, of their peoples and of their histories. And once you're done, don't stop. The conversation never stops. You are always changing and being changed by your environment. That's all from me for now. Thanks for listening. Maybe try going somewhere new today, if you're feeling up to it. This essay was finished on the 24th of the 1st, 2023, at 11.36pm.